The shutters hadn't been opened in years. The paintwork was crumbling, the gutters overflowed, and the cars in the driveway were rusted. Standing in the doorway, elderly and dishevelled, Linda told the visitor, We are fine. Please, just go away. Welcome to the Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Okay, hi. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories with me, Barry Henderson. This podcast is a place where you'll hear some of the craziest stories you've ever heard. Uh, Thank you if you come back after episode one, which was the Anjet Lyles story. If you're new to the podcast, then hi, hello, welcome. Each episode, I'll be taking you through a new story. Uh, Be it true crime, extreme survival stories of tangled webs of deceit, or sometimes just the outright weird. Murder, wrongful conviction, secrets unearthed, and really all that lies in between those things. Those stories you just find utterly delicious. I really love a good story, and an extraordinary one gives me a lot of joy. Okay, let's go. Today's story is that of Cheryl and Linda Waldman, two sisters who lived in Brookline, a town in Norfolk County, Massachusetts. Cheryl and Linda Waldman grew up in a big, beautiful house in Brookline in the 1950s. The three-storey house on Clinton Road stood out for its elegance and its size. It was a 4,000 square foot home with plenty of space, plenty of rooms, And just really a stunning house for anyone to live in. You can uh, Google the house. You can do a wee Google image search of Clinton Road. Find this house um, and just see absolutely how how beautiful it was. Um, What I might do is actually I'll put up some pictures on Instagram um, if if you want to have a look at it. So the house was beautiful, but what was going on inside? Cheryl and Linda Waldman didn't live there with their family alone. Another family shared the house with them. The Carvers. The Carver family were similar in age and size to the Waldmans and with so much space and so many rooms it was perfectly possible for the two families to live together. There were a total of six children between both families. So we've got two sets of parents each with three kids giving us a total of ten people all living under the one roof. Now at the time Some people did comment that this was a slightly odd living arrangement. Why would two families want to share one house? Not really sure. But over time, people stopped commenting on it. They stopped judging it and they just just let it be. The two fathers in this situation, one being Toby Waldman and the other Thomas Carver, they had set up a business together. And the family was living off of the profits. Their company name was Waldruth, and this company produced labels and dec- decals, which are like vinyl stickers. That, um, yeah, you might apply to like a window, or you might apply to a car window, or that sort of thing. Um, as well as this, the business um, they used to do some money lending as well to little businesses in the area that were trying to sort of get off the ground you would go to Toby Waldman and Thomas Carver they would give you some start up money and eventually they would um, get some profit from you so the Waldmans and the Carvers had a joint account and they used this to pay for all of the um, household bills okay a little bit more about the families the Waldmans had three daughters who were named Toby. Now, Toby's the eldest and she will be quite important in the story later. And Linda and Cheryl, who our story today is actually about, they are also very important to the story. 
And the Carvers had two sons. They had Thomas and John, and they had a daughter, Jacqueline. Now, all six of the children, it should be noted, were fairly close in age. I don't know if I think that's a good thing or a bad thing, that you would have six children all the same age, living under the same roof. It was obviously an awful lot of work for everybody, but, you know, it seemed to work for them. Perhaps it's better than them all being different ages, I don't know. A childhood friend of Cheryl Waldman said it was just like they were one big happy family. It was like the kids belonged to everybody. Now, as I said a minute ago, the unusual living situation was talked about in the town, but people said that both families living under this one roof were really unpretentious and they were very, very welcoming. They would invite people over for dinner, they would allow neighbourhood children to stay overnight, they had barbecues, they were a social house, it was a, it was a social situation. And so whatever was going on for them, it seemed to be working. It had a real family feeling, is one of the quotes I read. Now, the daughters in both families never ever married. But two of the uh, major celebrations that the families had were that both sons, um, they were married. But the daughters never married. So we'll just, we'll just put that aside for a second and return to that later. So, yeah, perhaps it is a bit odd that you have these uh, two families living together. But maybe actually what they wanted was they maybe all wanted this big, gorgeous house. Maybe this was the only way that they could actually do it. Now, I'm not really one to judge, so live and let live. You know, if that if that works for them, let them do it. Okay. Let's focus what the story is really about. It's really about Cheryl and Linda Waldman. So... Some information about them. Linda and Cheryl were both tall, slim, brown-haired girls. Linda worked hard at the school newspaper and the yearbook. She was described as a shy, pleasant girl who was sometimes a little quiet. Cheryl was less quiet and described as a little more cheerful than her sister. People who knew her as a teenager said she was easy to get on with, outgoing, friendly and would be the kind of girl who would go to university, do well and eventually have a family of her own. Okay, so two fairly normal sounding sisters. Yes, the living arrangement was a bit odd but no one really thought much of it as time passed. So both Linda and Cheryl had gotten to an age where they would leave the house and they would go to separate universities and undertake their degrees. However, there was trouble brewing in the Waldman Carver household. So the company that I mentioned earlier on that was run by the two fathers was beginning to fail. Uh, Money was becoming a real problem and they were being chased by creditors. So both men at this point filed for bankruptcy but also established some family trusts to protect the house from being taken away from them. So at this point we've got Cheryl and Linda, uh, they're in their late teens. Now the relationship between the two men running the company had become tense and it had begun to spill into the once idyllic home. Communication between both families began to break down And now there was arguing and there was fighting over money. Now, as I'd mentioned, Cheryl and Linda are both at university, but they return to the house because their mother had unfortunately become terminally ill with cancer. So their mother, Martha, unfortunately died aged 60 from cervical cancer. So just to pause on that and paint the picture properly, both sisters are now back in this huge house which has now seen most of the people move out, live elsewhere. So they're here, they're rattling around this huge property, which has all these spare rooms, and the business, which had once held both of these families together, is entirely crumbling, and the fights over money continue from both families. At this point, things turn really ugly. Now, Toby Waldman, who is Cheryl and Linda's elder sister, you remember I mentioned her a minute ago, 
ended up taking over her father's role in the company and in turn she tried to sue him and cut his ties with the business entirely. This action of suing him was based on Toby's belief that he had broken a rule about his own working hours within the company. It all gets very complicated and very messy at this point. There is a a back and a forth between Toby and her father, Mr. Waldman, and this sees them going in and out of court for a period of time, and it just becomes more and more complicated. And in the end, a judge threatens to take the court, take the case to full court, and start a full blown trial, knowing, knowing fine well this would be the end of this business. Um, because they just couldn't afford the expense of a full trial at this point. So eventually, the whole thing is dropped. Now, it's said that Cheryl and Linda's father at this time was mainly concerned that his girls would end up with nothing. He thought that their um, older sister, Toby, was an outright greedy woman happy to fuck her sisters over for money. After many, many legal injunctions it was eventually settled that the business would be dissolved and that the house would go to Cheryl and Linda. So now they had security. They at least owned this property. Some questions arise here around the sister's relationship with her dad. Were they close? Did they see him often? No one really knows. But the dad at this point was trying to get the eldest sister, Toby, taken out of the will and he succeeded in doing this so everything that he owned would go to Cheryl and to Linda Um, he began to suffer from really ill health and he eventually died of prostate cancer they had no more connection with any member of their large family things had broken down so much that the two sisters now only had each other and now something peculiar happens both sisters change their name, their surname, sorry, to Wheaton. Now, something peculiar happens. Both sisters change their surname to Wheaton. Gone was the surname Waldman. Why? Well, neither would ever say. Mm, Neither would ever say why they wanted to change their surname or why they picked Wheaton. Okay. Some theories suggest it might have been to do with not wanting to be tied to their father. Why? I'm not sure. Possibly to do with failed business. But something is making Cheryl and Linda want to change their surname. Now taking this one step further, Cheryl no longer wanted to go by the name Cheryl. She was now called Hope. So she had gone from Cheryl Waldman to Hope Wheaton. So with her father dead... Both sisters found themselves in yet another court battle. Older sister Toby wanted to see the will that she had been cut from, but the sisters never produced it, and Toby disappeared out of their lives. Shera would write at this point in one of the court documents, My very being is wasting away from chronic anguish, willfully inflicted. Obviously willfully inflicted by her sister. Okay, so what happened next? People who knew them and saw them together noted the following. Both sisters became codependent. Linda was said to take on the dominant big sister role. They were said to really love each other. They were best friends. It makes sense to me at this point that they would be best friends. For everything that they've been through, growing up in this situation coming back together in this house their older sister's trying to find this will why she been cut out of it etc yeah makes sense to me that they would be really close at this point it's stated that around about this time they started to retreat into the house and they were seen less and less so what happened in the next few years for the sisters it's unknown what the sister's day-to-day life looked like, but these things are known. The shutters of the house were always closed. 
They had given up driving anywhere. The car sat unused in the driveway. They weren't seen by neighbours very often. If they were seen working in the garden, they would keep their backs turned to avoid any interaction with neighbours. Cheryl, the younger of the sisters, would occasionally get a taxi to run about and pick up a few things here and there in town. But people say, well, she was pleasant and she would chat. She was always concerned that Linda would be worried if she was gone for too long. If the sisters ever received a delivery, they insisted on it being left at the door. No one was allowed to enter the home. So, a neighbour, Harriet Allen, a retired psychologist, she lived next door to them on Clinton Road, and she was really the only neighbour to have ever had any ongoing connection with the sisters, uh, particularly the younger one, who she first knew as a child, called Cheryl, who was now called Hope. This must have been a little bit odd, I think, for this woman. Well, she'd known her her whole entire life as Cheryl, and now she's knowing her as Hope. So Hope, Cheryl, stroke Hope, told uh, Harry Allen, the neighbour, that the sisters worked from home in computer-related jobs, and that explained why they never had to leave the house and why they didn't have to, day-to-day, go to an office or go to a workplace. But the neighbour didn't really have any real or regular contact with them. She would occasionally see them appear in the garden or on the driveway. She described them as being tattered and unkempt. The neighbour is a psychologist. She never says anything about mental health in either of the sisters. She says that she thinks they just decided that they wanted to live a reclusive life. And if that's what they wanted, then let them live that way. Let's stop just for a wee second and talk about what a reclusive life looks like. I'm no expert in psychology and I don't pretend to be. So I've done a little bit of research here. And again, I'm no expert. I'm just I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell you some of the things that I found that I thought were quite interesting. It's often said that a reclusive life is a symptom of manic depression. Again, no expert. Waking. You awake when you want. You are not ruled by an alarm, your partner, your dog, your child, etc, etc. You choose to enter the waking world when you are ready. Working. When you're good and ready, you begin to work. You will often set your own rules for when you work, how you work and how you manage your schedule. If necessary, you'll delay tasks and complete them when you think the time is right rather than work by someone else's timetable. Sex. You'll often decide masturbation is the best way to satisfy your own sex needs. Even if you're in a relationship, you may well continue sex with a partner, or if you're single and you have sexual encounters, you may continue that. But ultimately you believe sex with yourself is best. Sleeping. Similar to waking. You decide on your own schedule. A nap in the middle of the day is fine. It's your rules. Friends and family. Reclusivity is a continuum and may include some friendships, including with family members. But the full-fledged recluse believes that friends and family are more trouble than they're worth. Yes, it's selfish, but a recluse decides it's fair. They're not imposing on others, and they don't want them imposing on you. Okay, that's just some thoughts on being a recluse. Obviously, there are a million reasons in the world why someone would retreat into that lifestyle. Okay, I'm not saying that these are really why Shell and Linda Waldman decided to do this, but I just think it's interesting at this point that these two sisters decided to live a reclusive lifestyle. Back to the neighbour, Mrs Allen. She would often defend the sisters. If people were talking about them and and gossiping and whispering and saying, oh, aren't the Waldman sisters strange? What's going on in that house? She would she would defend them. She, um, uh, you know, they, they would often be called crazy. Oh, it's the crazy Waldman sisters. And um, she would jump to the defence and say, well, you know what? They've, they've got a right to live their life the way that they want to live it. And it's not really up to anyone else to judge. So now, a lot of time has passed 
And people are, are just accepting that the sisters are living the way that they want to live their life and there's nothing to worry about. But, and it's a big but, the house began to fall into complete disrepair and became noticeably decaying. The gutters were overflowing, the cars in the driveway were rusted, the garden overgrown. But the most alarming thing is that neither sister had been seen for an entire year. It was at this point that neighbours asked the police to do a welfare check and just see if the sisters were okay. There were three separate visits to the property by police. On the first two visits, they received no answer from the property and they left without much concern. On the next visit, the police officer noted the following. The shutters hadn't been opened in years. The paintwork was crumbling. The gutters overflowed and the cars in the driveway were rusted. Standing in the doorway, an elderly and dishevelled Linda told the visitor, We're fine. Please, just go away. The neighbours were still not satisfied that everything was okay. They felt the house was now rotting and when the neighbour Mrs Allen went one day to drop a magazine through the door, she was hit by an absolutely terrible smell. She said later, oh my God, the smell was terrible. In January of this year, 2017, Linda Waldman called her cousin in a very upset state. Having not spoken to her cousin in years, she stated the following. She had no running water. The pipes in the house had frozen. She asked that her cousin come to the house and get her immediately. When the cousin arrived, what she was about to find was the most disturbing thing she'd ever seen. She entered the property while Linda headed straight for the front door. The cousin was hit by a terrible smell. The same smell Mrs Allen had described. She walked into the kitchen and underneath the kitchen table lay the decomposing body of Cheryl Waldman. The first thing she did was call police. Police arrived and it was immediately treated as a sudden death. But there was nothing sudden about it. The body was in a terrible state of decay. Okay, at this point you're probably asking as many questions as I am. First of all, what the hell has happened here? Why was Cheryl's body under the kitchen table? What the actual fuck is going on here? Are we looking at self-neglect? Mental illness? A crime? An investigation was launched. A spokesman for the Norfolk District County's office has said, The investigation remains open. I have no comment on whether Linda Waldman could face charges for failing to report her sister's body. Now there's now an ongoing period of examination into why this death wasn't discovered earlier and why Linda lived for so long with her sister's body. So while she doesn't live there now, there's nothing to say that Linda couldn't return to the house. Legally she owns it and she could very well find herself back there. Linda, seemingly not too concerned by the discovery of her sister's body, began arranging building work to be done in the house in order to restore it to its former glory. And although the autopsy report is still to be given, police have said that they don't suspect foul play. Linda has said in the vaguest way that her sister died of natural causes and she was at a complete loss as to what to do with the body. A death certificate for Cheryl's body with the name Hope Wheaton on it now exists. So I looked at this um, death certificate online because you can find it if you search for it. It's really creepy that it just says under manner of death, unknown. I find that really unsettling. Uh, Linda Waldman has been tracked down by reporters and she's currently living in a Massachusetts hotel. When asked directly about her sister's death, she refused to answer. Only words she spoke while getting away from the reporter were the following. 
I'm not a lunatic. It was a tragedy. And so ends the story of Cheryl and Linda Waldman. This story um, has really stayed with me. I I think there's such sadness. I think we're dealing with mental health. It's just bizarre. It leaves me with so many questions about the sisters' relationships, the choice to become reclusive. When doing some research, I I came across a few people online who raised some really interesting points and had questions. I I thought they're really interesting. I'll just share a couple with you. Some people believe that Linda probably had every intention to report the death of her sister but that perhaps loneliness kept her from doing that and it became one of those things where she thought oh, I'll do it tomorrow oh, I'll do it the next day you know which at some point just turned into actually never never doing it and it just became a way of life this question arise, arises a lot um, online and it's one of the ones I had straight away as well did Cheryl die in the kitchen? Or did Linda move the body to under the table? And if so, why? Who knows? People find it strange as well, online, interesting. I did say this earlier on. None of the girls who ever grew up in that joint family home ever married. Why? You've got four daughters. Not one of them was ever married. Okay. Maybe it's just coincidence. I don't know. I think it's strange. There's a lot of uh, discussion around was there something else going on in that house with the parents' living situation? Was there a sexual relationship between the adults? And if so, what impact did that have on the children? These are theories, musings, guesses, if you will. As I always say, I don't have the answers to the story of Cheryl and Linda, but I find it absolutely extraordinary and I hope that you do too. Okay, that's about it from me, except to say that if you want to reach out to me, you can. You can do it in the following ways. So I have a Facebook group. It's uh, Extraordinary Stories Podcast. On Twitter, I'm at Extra Stories Pod. I'm on Instagram. It's Extraordinary Stories. You'll find it. Or you can email me. Please do. I'd love to hear from you. It's Extraordinary Stories Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. And if you know a story worth sharing, then let me know. Okay, thanks. Goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.